In this module, we are going to talk about two of the evaluations that are completed for criminal court, competency and criminal responsibility. First, let's talk about competency in general before we move to discussing how it more specifically applies to criminal court. Competency in general refers to someone who has a sufficient mental or physical capacity or has legitimate authority to engage in some legally significant act. With regard to civil court, one way it applies is in making or creating a contract. In order for a contract to be enforceable, all parties must be capable of understanding their mutual obligations. For example, minors are deemed by law to have a diminished capacity to contract. What this means is that contracts by a minor are not necessarily always void, but they are voidable due to their age. The same concept applies to creating a will. When a will is contested, it is usually because of one of two factors. One, the tester, or the person making the will, lacked testamentary capacity. Or two, the person making the will was subject to undue influence such as coercion, manipulation, deception, or intimidation. Competency can also refer to a person's ability to make decisions regarding their own treatment. Most of the time this is done through informed consent. However, there are situations in which persons lose their ability to consent to their own treatment, such as in an, in an inpatient setting. Most of the time these individuals have lost their ability to consent and cannot refuse to take their medications or refuse treatment. A person must also be competent in order to consent to participate in research. When an individual is not competent to make these decisions, there are two ways of protecting the person. The first is through a guardianship. A guardianship is a legal relationship between a competent adult or guardian and a person who is no longer able to make reasonable and responsible decisions. The second is through a conservatorship, which is a court-appointed relationship in which the conservator becomes the person deemed incapable of administering his or her own financial affairs because of physical, mental, or other capacity. You can think of this as a guardian of a state. So here are some examples to help you understand the difference. Hopefully you know who Kurt Cobain is. If not, he was the lead singer of a band called Nirvana. He struggled with a drug addiction and committed suicide in 1994. At the time, he was married to singer Courtney Love, and they had a daughter, Frances Bean, who was two years old. After Kurt's suicide, Courtney Love lost custody of Frances, and Kurt Cobain's mother became the guardian of Frances, and remained her guardian until she was 18 years old. This is an example of a guardianship. On the other hand, there's conservatorship. Remember when Britney Spears was hospitalized for a psychiatric hold back in 2008? Well, her father became her conservator and maintained control of her companies and finances until she rega regained competency to handle those matters. Other examples of people who have had conservatorships include Lindsay Lohan and Amy Winehouse. All right, let's move to talking about competency in the criminal justice system. The authority of the government originates from three places. First, it comes from the police power, which authorizes the state to protect the community. This area is controlled by government and allows states to protect and incarcerate individuals who are threats to the public or commit crimes. The second arm is the criminal justice system, whose goal is to punish, rehabilitate, and deter crime. The criminal justice system also oversees the incarceration of individuals who are sent to them via police. The third area of responsibility refers to parents patre, which appoints the state to be the general guardian of those who cannot care for themselves. Essentially, the state's authority is as a guardian. It was originally reserved for children mentally retarded and the insane. 
This power deals with the safety and needs of the individual rather than society as a whole. To truly understand competency, we have to understand our constitutional rights. We have the right to liberty, safety, treatment, the least restrictive alternative, and the right to refuse involuntary medication. The first right, the right to liberty, is the rationale behind lawsuits claiming false imprisonment. We have a right to be free. The right to safety refers to the fact that involuntarily committed residents have a constitutional right to be reasonably safe, to reasonably safe conditions of confinement and freedom from unreasonable body restraints and habilitation. This means that we all have a right to be supplied with the means to develop maximum independence and in activities of daily living through treatment or training. The right to treatment refers to the individualized right to treatment geared towards the particular patient. This means there should be a humane, psychological, and physical environment, qualified staff in numbers sufficient to administer adequate treatment, and individualized treatment plans. The right to a least restrictive alternative involves moving patients from mental institutions to less structured living smaller facilities, and reintegrating them into the community. Lastly, the right to refuse involuntary medication is exactly as it sounds. However, there is a due process clause that permits the state to treat individuals with a serious mental illness with antipsychotic medications against their will if they are dangerous to themselves or others and the treatment is in their medical interest. Now, competency to stand trial. This is one of the most commonly assessed issues in the criminal justice system. Competency to stand trial refers to a defendant's ability to function in a meaningful fashion in a legal proceeding. They cannot be impaired in their ability to understand the legal proceedings, communicate with their attorneys, appreciate their own role in the proceedings, or make legally relevant decisions. The issue of competency is relevant during all stages of the court process and is often raised in pretrial hearings. However, it can be raised at any time by the judge, district attorney, or defense counsel. But why does it matter? Why does someone need to be competent to stand trial? Does a person's competency matter if they committed a crime? Well, the law says committing a crime will lead to punishment, so why does it matter if they understand it? Well, the fairness and dignity of the adversary system requires that defendants be able to defend themselves against the charges brought against them. Given that a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty, they need to be able to understand the charges against them so that they can meaningfully participate in their case. Additionally, punishment is only morally justifiable if a person understands why they are getting punished. Furthermore, our Fifth and Sixth Amendments protect individuals in these types of situations. Both the Fifth and Sixth Amendments are applicable to the states through the Due Process Clause of the Fourth Amendment. With regard to the Fifth Amendment, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. This is a right for all defendants, but if they are not competent or do not understand what is going on, they may waive their right to remain silent and incriminate themselves. As soon as the defendant pleads guilty, they waive their right to remain silent and not incriminate themselves. As for the Sixth Amendment, all persons have the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against them, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in their favor, to have the assistance of counsel for their defense. With the guilty plea, defendants waive their rights to be clearly informed of the nature and cause of the charges against them, 
to prepare an adequate defense with the assistance of counsel, to have a jury trial, confront accusers, and call defense witnesses in their defense. All right, let's talk about the standard for competency to stand trial that was set by Dusky v. United States in 1960. Prior to this case, the standard was a simple knowledge quiz that asked, do you know who your lawyer is? In this case, Milton Dusky, along with two juvenile co-defendants, abducted a teenage girl. He faced a charge, along with two juveniles, of unlawfully transporting a female across state lines and attempting to rape her. A pre-trial psychiatric evaluation rendered a diagnosis of schizophrenic reaction, chronic undifferentiated type. A separate psychiatric report and psychiatric testimony at trial stated that Dusky could not properly assist counsel because of suspicious thoughts, including a belief that he was being framed. He was nevertheless found competent to stand trial, convicted of rape, and after the Eighth Circuit affirmed his conviction, the case was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court overturned the lower court's conviction and remanded the case to the lower courts to assess Dusky's competence to stand trial. The Supreme Court held that the test for competence to stand trial must be whether the accused has sufficient present ability to consult with his lawyer, with a reasonable degree of rational understanding and whether he has a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against him. There are five important components to the Dusky Standard that are important to know. First, the standard delineates two prongs. The first measures the defendant's capacity to understand the criminal process. This involves understanding who, partic who participants are, such as the prosecutor and judge, and knowing what their roles are. The second measures the defendant's ability to function in that process. This involves consulting with counsel in the preparation of a defense. The second component focuses on the defendant's present ability to consult with counsel and to understand the proceedings. Always remember that competency refers to present ability, which is fundamentally different from testing for criminal responsibility, which is respect retrospective. The third component emphasizes the defendant's capacity, as opposed to willingness, to relate to counsel and understand the proceedings. This is an important distinction, as people often assume that someone can be unwilling to work with their attorney and be found incompetent. Just simply being a difficult person or refusing to participate in your case does not constitute incompetence. However, if a person is not talking to their attorney because they have paranoid delusions that their attorney is in cahoots with the judge and district attorney in a plot against them, then they would most likely be found incompetent. The fourth component states that a defendant must possess a reasonable degree of understanding. This suggests that the test is a flexible one and that it does not require perfect understanding. The fifth component emphasizes the presence or absence of rational and factual understanding, which means an emphasis on cognitive functioning. The presence of a particular IQ or signs of mental illness by themselves do not automatically equate with competency. This is the competency standard in Colorado. Under Colorado law, incompetent to proceed means that as the result of a mental disability or developmental disability, the defendant does not have the sufficient present ability to consult with the defendant's lawyer with a reasonable degree of rational understanding in order to assist in the defense, or that the defendant does not have a rational and factual understanding of the criminal proceedings. In Colorado, when someone is found incompetent to proceed, the accused can be remanded to the Colorado State Hospital 
until he or she has been restored to competency or for the maximum term of confinement that would that could be imposed for the offenses with which he or she has been charged or in cases where the defendant is not charged with a crime involving violent behavior and the defendant's psychiatric examination suggests he or she may be treated on an outpatient basis, the court may order the defendant to undergo treatment at or under the supervision of a private mental health facility designated by the department. Let's talk a little bit about mental conditions and competence to stand trial. Psychotic disorders, such as schizophrenia, are the most common category of disorders rendering an individual incompetent to stand trial. As for an intellectual disability or mental retardation, it does qualify under mental defect and may impair a defendant's cognitive ability to understand their charges and to legally assist their attorney. However, when it comes to personality disorders, it depends on the state and whether their statute specifically addresses personality disorders. Typically, a personality disorder is not considered sufficient on its own to render a person incompetent. In Colorado, the statute clear, clarifies that behavior stemming from antisocial behavior does not qualify as a mental disability. Lastly, there's amnesia. Amnesia alone does not automatically equate with incompetency to stand trial. That's because a person may have amnesia for an event, but still may be able to have a factual and rational understanding of their case, the legal proceedings, and be capable of working with their attorney. I'll give you an example of a case like this. Mr. X was charged with vehicular manslaughter after he was driving his car while he was intoxicated and crossed the median and hit another car head-on. Both people in the oncoming car passed away and Mr. X suffered a severe head injury and was life flighted to the nearest hospital. When he recovered, he was informed of the details of the accident and the charges against him. Even though he could not remember the event, he was able to read the police report, see the evidence against him, and eventually proceed with his court case in a meaningful way. The Sixth Amendment guarantees a criminal defendant the right to assistance of counsel. However, defendants may desire to represent themselves in a pro se defense. This standard was established in Ferretta v. California in 1975. Mr. Ferretta was charged with grand theft in Los Angeles, California. Well before the trial, he requested that the judge allow him to represent himself. The judge questioned Mr. Ferretta about his decision and learned that Mr. Ferretta had a high school education, had previously represented himself in a criminal prosecution, and did not want an appointed public defender because of his concerns about the heavy workload in the public defender's office. There was no evidence that Mr. Ferretta had a mental disorder. Although the judge originally granted Mr. Ferretta's request, he later reversed his own decision and appointed a public defender, ruling that Mr. Ferretta had no constitutional right to represent himself. Mr. Ferretta was found guilty and sentenced to prison. On appeal, the U.S. Supreme Court held that a defendant has a constitutional right to self-representation when he or she voluntarily and intelligently elects to represent him or herself. In Godinez v. Moran in 1993, Richard Allen Moran was charged with three counts of first-degree murder after he walked into the Red Pearl Saloon and shot the bartender and a customer prior to robbing the cash register. Nine days later, he shot and killed his ex-wife and then unsuccessfully attempted suicide by shooting himself and slitting his wrists. 
He was found competent to stand trial and informed that he wanted to plead guilty and discharge his attorneys. He was then found guilty and sentenced to death. Mr. Moran then appealed claiming he was mentally incompetent to represent himself. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the competency standard to waive right to cancel, counsel and plead guilty is the same standard for determining competency to stand trial. The court specifically noted that whether or not the defendant could represent himself adequately was irrelevant to his decision to forego legal counsel. In Indiana v. Edwards in 2008, Ahmed Edwards attempted to steal a pair of shoes from an Indiana department store security officer. He fired three shots, one of which wounded a bystander. He was charged with attempted murder, battery with a deadly weapon, criminal recklessness, and theft. He was found incompetent to stand trial, committed to a state hospital for trial restoration, and eventually found trial competent after five years. Mr. Edwards asked to represent himself. The court appointed an attorney who acted on Mr. Edwards' behalf, and the jury deadlocked on some of the charges. At his retrial, Mr. Edwards again asked to represent himself. The trial judge ruled that although he was competent to stand trial, he was not competent to represent himself. He was then tried and convicted. Mr. Edwards appealed the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, alleging that his rights had been violated because he had not been allowed to represent himself. Even though he had been found competent to stand trial, the U.S. Supreme Court held that a court may deny a mentally ill defendant found competent to stand trial the right to self-representation. However, they did not set any specific standard other than the ability to carry out the basic tasks needed to present one's own defense without the help of counsel. So what can happen if we don't evaluate competency? Now. The only time you 
After the issue of competency has been raised, a judge typically orders an evaluation, which is typically completed by a psych psychiatrist or psychologist. Again, the evaluator is concerned with the defendant's a present ability of competence, not the legal definition of insanity or criminal responsibility. There are several instruments an evaluator can use to assess competency, and one of the screener instruments is the competency screening test. It is a 22 item sentence completion test where scores range from two, which is a complete answer, to zero, which is an incomplete answer. This measure has been criticized for having an extremely positive view of the legal process and produces a large number of false positives, which means that it suggests that people are incompetent when in actuality, they are not competent to stand trial. These are some of the examples of questions on the competency screening test, such as when I go to court, the lawyer will blank. The way a court trial is decided is blank, and so on. Another tool is the revised competency assessment instrument. This is actually what we use at the hospital I work at to evaluate competency. It's a semi-structured interview that assesses 13 functions relevant to competency for standing trial. The scores range from one, total incapacity, to five, total capacity. There's usually concern if several scores are three or less. And it's shown to have a 90% agreement with competency decisions made after extensive hospital evaluations. Another tool is the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool. It contains hypothetical situations that the defendant has to comment on. It includes information on four abilities, the understanding of charges and trials, appreciation of relevant information, reasoning with information during decision making, and making a choice. Let's look at some of the facts about competency evaluations. As stated earlier, competency to stand trial evaluations represent one of the most common criminal referrals and are estimated conservatively at 60,000 annually. Why? Well, aside from competency being the relevant issue at hand, sometimes these referrals are made out of ignorance of the standard. 
Sometimes they are used to obtain information for an attorney's case or as part of a strategic plan for the case. Surveys of public defenders indicate that defense lawyers have concerns about their client's competency in about 10 to 15 percent of their cases. However, motions for evaluations are made in fewer than half of these cases of doubted competence. One study comparing referred to non-referred cases found that in most important, the most important predictor of attorney's decision to refer was disorganized speech by the defendant. Other important factors include pressures from defendants' families and strategic considerations. A review of 10 studies reported the frequency of competency evaluations and findings of incompetency suggested that only about 30% of defendants referred for competency evaluations are actually found incompetent. This is a list of some of the characteristics of those found incompetent. They're usually single males, minorities, have low levels of education and intelligence, are unemployed, they have previous involvement in the legal and mental health systems, they exhibit symptoms of current serious mental disorders, and they're charged with more serious crimes. In the 1990s, we saw that juveniles were allowed to be transferred to adult court for serious offenses. However, the issue of competency remains controversial, for adolescents, that is. It is important to note that the controversy refers to whether a juvenile can be considered competent to commit a murder, not whether they should be transferred to adult court. This is due to the fact that juveniles by nature are most likely to be incompetent due to their immaturity, their poor judgment, their inability to make good decisions, they're more apt to confess, and their overall abilities are lower, as they are juveniles. In the United States, each state determines the age in which a juvenile is considered competent to commit a crime. If a state does not have a statutory minimum, the state relies on common law which means that seven is the minimum age in most states. For federal crimes, the age has been set at 11. In Iran, the ages range from nine for girls and 15 for boys. New Zealand is 14, whereas in Brazil, the age is 18. Their official age of criminal responsibility is from age 12, children's actions are subject to juvenile legal proceedings. So what happens after the evaluation? Defendants who are found incompetent proceed to trial. If the crime is not serious, the charges may be dropped for those who have been found incompetent. Defendants who are found incompetent typically go to a mental health institution. At the institution, they are treated for restoration of competency. When restored, the defendant proceeds back to court to handle their case. This is important to know that being found incompetent is not a free pass. If they are faced with a serious crime, they will either be restored to competency or remain at the hospital if they cannot be. If it is determined that competence may never be restored, many defendants remain in mental health institutions despite a law prohibiting indefinite confinement. So how is competence restored? Usually through psychoactive medication and defendants who receive treatment involving videos and instructions on courtroom procedures in addition to this medication were found more likely to be competent upon reevaluation than those only receiving medication. So overall, the treatment involves being stabilized on medications due to the fact that their competency is found because they have a mental disorder, in addition to education about the legal system, their charges, and how to work with their attorney. All right, let's talk about some differences between competency and insanity. 
They are obviously not the same thing, even though most people tend to think they are. A defendant may be found psychotic, mentally ill, or mentally retarded, but still competent and able to stand trial. This is a really important thing to distinguish because just because a person has a mental disorder or disability does not mean they are automatically incompetent. That mental disorder or disability has to be the reason that it impairs their factual and rational understanding of their charges, legal proceedings, or impairs their ability to work with their attorney. And again, competence only refers to present ability. So somebody could have been found incompetent on previous charges a couple years prior, and now they're in court again facing new charges. That doesn't automatically mean that they're incompetent at this time because they were found incompetent before. So the competency evaluator would, have, would evaluate their present ability at this current time.